Welcome to the second episode of the Dare to Guelph podcast. This is Guilherme. I'm the communications coordinator of Dare to Guelph, which is the center for dairy research and innovation of the University of Guelph. So before we start this episode, I just would like to remind you to give us a follow on Twitter. And we also have a really nice newsletter uh, called Depeller. So make sure that you take a look on that. And today we will be talking about infectious disease in dairy cattle. We also we will also talk about biosecurity, bulk tank testing, management practices to minimize risk and spread of disease. So uh, lots to talk about today. And I would like to introduce our guest, Dr. David Kelton. Dr. Kelton is a faculty member in the Department of Population Medicine of the University of Guelph, and he's also a veterinarian with more than 30 years of experience in the dairy industry. So, Dave, welcome to the Dairy to Wealth podcast, and I'm very excited to record this episode with you. Thanks very much. I'm thrilled to be here for sure. Um, That's great. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to say it, it's uh, it's it's really fun to to do this. Um, you know, thinking back a little bit on on what I've done in my career and and where I've been, this is sort of um, really nice that we have this opportunity to share some of the research that we do because I think a lot of times in academia we do some really exciting stuff and and we get to the end, we're excited. I think the people around us are excited, but we don't necessarily always get to share it as broadly as we like. So this is a great opportunity. Thank you for that. That's great, Dave. Yeah, I really think that uh, this podcast is about sharing all this information, this great information from the University of Guelph. And before we start talking about your work and your perspective on dairy cattle diseases, biosecurity and management, uh, Perhaps uh, you could share a little bit about yourself and your overall experience with the dairy industry and also your involvement with the dairy to wealth. I think it would be great to hear this from you. Great. Thanks very much. So, in fact, I'm a three-time graduate of the University of Guelph. I graduated from the vet school here in 84, um, spent three and a half years or so at Cornell doing clinical practice, mostly with dairy herds, um, came back in, in 87, did a master's in reproduction uh, with Ken Leslie and John Walton, and then a PhD in epidemiology with Wayne Martin and, and joined the faculty in 1994. Um, when I joined the faculty, I was, I was really excited about dairy and looking for opportunities to do dairy research. And, and really throughout my professional career, I've, I've had that opportunity primarily because I've had some great mentors and I've also had some great opportunities, worked closely with Dairy Farmers of Ontario, worked closely with at that initially Ontario DHI that has morphed over the years and is now Lactinet gotten strong support and funding from OMAFRA and Dairy Farmers of Canada. So it's it's been a fun journey, had a lot of great mentors, colleagues, and, and some wonderful grad students. And some of what I'll share with you today is really to the credit of those students that I've had the opportunity to work with because they're they've been my part of my inspiration. So it's 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 been a fun ride. I've certainly had the privilege of holding a research chair funded by Dairy Farmers of Ontario. I held that for 10 years. Uh, until my retirement recently. Um, I'm really proud that the university saw it fit to grant me emeritus status, so I get to keep doing some of the fun things that I've been doing, so I'm not quite done yet, and uh, so it's it's great. Um, you also mentioned dairy at Guelph, and, and another thing that I'm really, really excited about and, and proud of, um, I've been part of the group that formed dairy at Guelph from from the beginning and and I thought I think we saw that as as a need to be able to brand ourselves and better our communications not only internally within the university but with our external stakeholders and one of the you know one of the things I think that we envisaged when when we uh, started dairy at Guelph were things like this podcasts like this where we would have the opportunity to share research findings and so on with a much broader community than what we've done traditionally. So, um, you know, it's early days, but I think we're in good hands and I think we're doing great things. So I'm excited. <laughs> Amazing. Dave. Yeah, no, that's very impressive. Um, it's great to hear this from you. So uh, 
in the first part of this this episode, um, we will be talking about some uh, about the National Dairy Study, about proaction, uh, about the disease surveillance program for Ontario dairy farmers, and well, I think that makes sense to start with the National Dairy Study that you led a few years ago. So, could you talk about the dimension of this survey and perhaps some some lessons that you learned from it? Yeah, happy to do so. So, <clears throat> it started about uh, you know it, it goes back. The National Dairy Study was done in 2014-15, and it's hard to believe it's almost 10 years ago. And and it was really a national collaboration involving colleagues across the country and funded by Dairy Farmers of Ontario and Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And we got a pot of money to do, for the first time ever, a national survey and, and get a snapshot of what was going on in the industry and in, in dairy industry in Canada. A lot of projects had been done regionally before or really focused on unique diseases or, or issues, but we've never, we had never up to that point had sort of a broad comprehensive scan of what was going on in the dairy industry from a management health productivity perspective. And, and so this was an opportunity to do that. We modeled it actually after the NOM study, which has been going on in the U.S., had been going on for over 35 years then. They had done a across all commodity groups, but they had done a number of dairy studies. And so we really wanted something that that was comparable. And, and I think we we're able to pull it off. Um, again, sort of my my name is associated with it. And, and I was certainly the, uh, you know, I, I did a bit of the work, but there were others, certainly Kathy Bauman, who was a postdoc with us at the time, did the lion's share of the work and had some fantastic graduate students like Stephanie Croyle and Emily Bellage. And the study was really done in two parts. The first part was a survey, quite a daunting, large um, online survey um, that was completed by over 1,300 dairy producers in the country. And given that we had at that time about 11,000 dairy producers, well over 10% of, of dairy producers in the country completed the survey from across all 10 provinces, across a range of management practices. So. You know, we thought it was a good representation of 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 the industry, and and we were able to use that then to create some summary information, um, understand what was going on from a management health, uh, reproduction management, utter health, mastitis control, all those kinds of things. Um, through that survey, we then followed it up in the summer of 2015 with uh, farm visits. So we had a crew of of students visiting farms across the country um collecting information collecting samples including bulk tank samples and i i know we'll uh, come back to that later in this podcast uh to again gather some some more rich in-depth information some samples for testing and so all in all it was it was pretty exciting and and we we're pretty pleased to pull that off we're we're now trying to figure out whether we can actually do it again 10 years later but but we'll save that for another time no that's great yes it's it's very impressive and i think there is a website with some more information about it is that right there is. We published over 20 papers. We created videos, uh, fact sheets, uh, infographics, and they're all available and accessible on the National Dairy Study website, which is www.nationaldairystudy, all one word, dot ca. Great, Dave. Yes. No, the dimension of this study, it's, it's, it's very impressive. So, uh, and I also know that there's another very important program, uh, which is called ProAction from the Dairy Farmers of Canada. And I believe you I believe it you you were involved with this as well, right? So perhaps you could explain to us like what this program is and give it give us an overview of its relevance in the dairy industry. Yeah, so so ProAction is the National Dairy Quality Assurance Program. It was developed by dairy farmers, for dairy farmers, and and really the umbrella organization is Dairy Farmers of Canada. It's implemented provincially by the 10 provincial dairy producer organizations. And so I did not have primary involvement with the with with ProAction, but I 
Um, I worked with a number of people and provided some guidance advice when I was asked. And, and I think, I think it's evolved into a fantastic quality assurance, national quality assurance program for the dairy industry. I think it's, it's right up there with one of the best in, in the world. It, it's really founded on six, six principles or six components, milk quality, food safety, um, environmental stewardship, um, animal care or welfare, traceability within the industry and finally biosecurity and and all of these six elements have been implemented over time through the national dairy study when we were doing that we did some on-farm animal care or welfare assessments through our national dairy study and at that time dfc and and the proaction team were developing their farm-based measures for animal care so we actually worked with them we used a lot of the same methods that they would ultimately incorporate in, into ProAction to do our animal care assessments. And so it was a bit of a test run for what would ultimately become part of the uh, the ProAction animal care um, component. And, and so it was a really nice opportunity. And, and again, w- working closely with the dairy industry, if I, as I've had the pleasure of doing these these many years, it was a really nice opportunity to work hand in hand and and see some of this develop and evolve. Also, there is a, uh, I know that you were involved with another uh, very important uh, disease surveillance program. And I think you mentioned a little bit about that already uh, using bulk tank testing, correct? So could you uh, ex- explain or talk a little bit more about this program? Sure. So one of one of the things that we always are looking to do is is to monitor or or put in place surveillance to find out how much disease we have on farms and and within farms. Routine testing can be quite expensive, especially if we test individual animals. So one option that we have in the dairy industry is to test bulk tank milk. So because of the way our dairy industry is set up, um, because of our supply management system, we know exactly where all of our farms are in Canada. We can identify them, we know where they are, and they also co- need to comply with regulatory issues around milk quality and food safety. So what happens on every dairy farm in, in the country and certainly in, in the province is that every time milk is picked up by the milk transporter, which happens either every other day in most cases in some farms every day, there's a sample of that commingled milk, that bulk tank milk that makes its way to the labs um, across the country that do the testing for components, for residues, for uh, somatic cell count and all those things. So we've always been interested in extracting more information out of that bulk tank milk sample. And the question is, can we use that sample to get a good sense of whether herds have a particular disease. So for that to be true, cows that have either leukosis or yonis or or whatever need to be shedding something into the milk that we can identify. So that's either antibody or organism that we can identify through, through testing. There are, in fact, many tests available that have been validated for testing bulk tank milk. And so we were approached, we did some pilot work, for instance, through the National Dairy Study, where we did some bulk tank milk testing. But then about five years ago, prior to the pandemic, we were approached by Dairy Farmers of Ontario as they were about to launch the biosecurity component of ProAction that we talked about. And we had a conversation about what can we do to support biosecurity and, and disease control on Ontario dairy farms. And, and one of the ideas was, well, if we do some routine testing of bulk tank milk samples, provide that information back to farmers who can then share it with their veterinarians, will that start a conversation about disease control and biosecurity and make it real rather than biosecurity quite often is abstract, right? You you know, we talk about, well, doing all sorts of good things, but if we put it in the context of a, of a particular disease, whether that's leukosis, yonis, mastitis, that a farmer is worried about, knows about, wants to do something about, then that makes that whole interaction more productive. So with Dairy Farmers of Ontario and with OMAFRA, we got some funding to do a pilot study. And, and so we've just finished 
um, our second round of bulk tank milk testing, where we've tested every herd in the province once about 18 months ago and more recently now. Again, it was delayed a bit because of the pandemic. Um, provide the information back to Ontario dairy farmers and through that try to get them talking to their veterinarians about infectious disease control. We hope that will will maybe move us in in a in a positive direction in dealing with some of these you know production limiting diseases that we talked about earlier. Okay, great. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think this was a great start for this episode. So we touched on disease control, biosecurity programs. Uh, Dr. Ken, Kel, uh, Kelton already mentioned about testing uh, bulk, uh, bulk tank milk and I would like to focus a little bit more on a specific uh, infectious disease that is very important and perhaps it, we could spend some, some time here discussing about it. You already mentioned it. Um, so what should we know about this gastrointestinal disease called Yon's disease? Oh, wow. OK, where to start? <laughs> um, yeah, Yoni's disease has been an interest of mine for for many years, and and um, I've actually had the privilege of working with colleagues internationally where we're all trying to figure out how to uh, control this particular disease. It's caused by a bacterium, Mycobacterium avium subspecies paratuberculosis, which is a, a mouthful, so we tend to call it MAP for short. Um, and it's a really slowly progressive disease. And so based on what we know, um, infection in animals comes from the fecal oral route. So one animal that's infected, the feces are infected, they contaminate something, the next animal essentially, you know, consumes something that's contaminated with with the with the bacterium and you know, from from the feces of another animal and becomes infected. We believe most of that happens with young calves. So um, probably right around the time of calving or in their early days when they're in the maternity pen with a with one or more cows that may be infected and they sort of have this manure meal as as we we refer to it sometimes. And but what happens then is it takes a long time for that infection to get established and it may be up to two or more years later before we see any clinical signs. And so we don't often see a lot of clinical signs from the disease. Again, it's one of these subclinical production limiting diseases. A small fraction of animals, usually milking cows, will develop some clinical signs. They'll develop diarrhea, but still maintain a good appetite. And, and over time, they'll waste away in spite of the fact that they're eating. And this is really caused by thickening of the gut and limiting the absorption of all the nutrients that they're eating and, and is eventually fatal once it gets to that point. One of the reasons we're quite, we've been quite interested in this particular disease is there's a body of, of evidence that would suggest that there is some kind of a relationship between Yoni's disease in in cattle and and sheep and goats can also get it and in some wildlife and Crohn's disease in people um now whether it's causal or not is still up to open to debate in other words does that same organism cause at least some cases of Crohn's disease or do patients with Crohn's disease you know is is that a good environment where the this particular organism can set up shop so it's sort of chicken and an egg discussion but it has certainly put some some focus on on Yoni's disease from that perspective. So, you know, we've been trying over many many years, and and again, it's not ourselves alone. Um, there are groups in the U.S. and all across Europe, Australia, and New Zealand who have been trying to control um, Yoni's disease in cattle herds for many years. We've tried many things, some more successful, some less successful. Um, I think we're making some progress in particularly countries that have stuck with it and been quite aggressive. And, you know, I'll point to the Netherlands and, and Norway as a couple of examples are really making some tangible progress in, in Yoni's know, control. So, but it's a, uh, it's, it's a tough thing to do for sure. Yeah, no, it really seems very challenging and well, it's good that you're looking into it, right? And exploring a, a little bit, uh, more about it. And I know that I think back in 2010, if I'm not wrong, I, I think there was a program for education and management for Yon's disease, right? 
There was. So what happened back in the sort of 2008-2009 is is there was a lot of discussion quite broadly about this potential relationship between Yoni's and Crohn's disease. And and so the dairy industry and and in fact this this happened in in a number of regions across Canada and and but I was involved with what was going on here in Ontario. Ontario dairy producers said, you know what, this um you know, if it turns out to be that that Yoni's actually causes Crohn's, that would be bad for us as an industry, not only because of the impact on on our cattle, but also the potential impact on people and our market and everything else. So they said, we need to get out in front of this. And, and so, in fact, the dairy industry in Ontario committed funds. We got some support from, again, Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, um, and put together a program that was developed jointly, led by producers, but involving veterinarians and other other members in the industry, to try to, again, raise awareness and start the process of thinking about how best to control Yoni's disease. So what we did is, is we launched a program called the Ontario um, uh, Yoni's Management um, and Education Program. Um, we had funding for about four years, so it ran from 2010 to 2013, and it was really to kickstart Yoni's control, and, and it involved a number of elements. Um, we did some testing at the herd level of individual animals. We tried to re remove some of the, the positive animals from the herds. We tried to make sure that Producers, veterinarians, and others working in the industry understood the disease so that they could take appropriate action. And really, the the fundamental piece was we developed, and that was under the leadership of folks like uh, Dr. Ann Godkin, who was working for OMAFRA at the time, a risk assessment um, to sort of structure a conversation between veterinarians and dairy producers about what we knew about the disease what they should be doing in terms of best practices to control it and to identify deficiencies in their individual operations that they might be able to um, adjust or fix to help them down the road to control Yoni's disease. And, and so we were quite pleased. We had a lot of activity, a lot of publicity over those four years. Over half of the dairy producers in Ontario participated in the program so given that it was a voluntary program we were really thrilled about that right that that we had such good uptake um and that was really the foundational part of our our yoni's control program moving forward nice great yes it's interesting that you mentioned that farmers they they can give you this feedback and they really want to participate and be part of um the solution of the problem right um and i also know dave um that you and your research team recently uh, published some studies where you look at, at some dairy farmers, I think in Ontario, uh, who had previously engaged on your disease control program. So I believe you were looking at motivations and bar bar barriers on these practices. Um, could, you, could you talk a little bit about the challenge, on, like how the talents on this field looks like? Sure. Yeah, we've, we've done a lot of, so when we started the Yoni's program back in 2010, 2013, as we like to do, we, we incorporate a fair bit of research around programs like that. That was part of my role in working with the dairy industry. And so, you know, over the years, we've had a number of, I've had a number of students, uh, Ricky Sorga, uh, Laura Peeper, um, Diego Nobrega was a, was a postdoc with us more recently and, and, and really led a lot of the bulk tank milk testing. And one of my most recent PhD students, Jamie Yamada is, is really taken that this most recent step. What we found was that when we were launching the program and when we were trying to educate dairy producers, Stephen Roche was one of our PhD students and he did some focus group work with dairy producers and talk to them a bit about, you know, what, what their attitude was, what their frustrations were about Yoni's control. And, 
you know, one of the things that he found back in in that initial period was that producers believed the disease was important and felt that they should be doing something about it, but they weren't sure that they really understood well enough and had the tools available to really take it by the horns, if you will, and and control it. So through Steve's work, we developed some whiteboard videos, which are also available on uh, we've got a yonis.ca website if somebody wants, wants to see that <laughs> um, to try to simplify some of some of the messaging. And so coming out of that, we felt pretty good. We thought, you know, we've got the industry nicely started on para TB control on Yoni's control. Um, and so if we fast forward to 2017, we thought, well, we're a few years out. Let's do an do a round of bulk tank milk testing. This was this was done for DFO just to see the impact of the program. And so we tested all 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 producers in in the province and actually found that the number of farms with a bulk tank positive test had gone up rather than down, which quite honestly disappointed us. And and so we started <laughs> scratching our heads and said, wow, this is this is not good. At least, you know, what it looks like it's not good. We need to understand what's going on. And so at that time, uh, Jamie Amata, who was a veterinarian, was interested in coming back doing some graduate work. And so I said, Jamie, because he was a summer student, actually, when we were doing our initial Yoni's program, I said, Jamie, how would you like to do some follow-up work? And he jumped at the opportunity. And so what Jamie did was as you mentioned at the outset, sorry for the long-winded answer, but uh, what Jamie did is he said, oh, we said, okay, let's let's take some of those farms that we visited and were part of that initial program and visit them again, look at what they're doing from a risk assessment management perspective, do some testing again, and really try to better understand which ones had success, because certainly some farms went from being positive and were negative. So we had some success stories and others we had what we'll call failures. So either, you know, didn't reduce their their yonis or in fact had been negative and moved to positive. And so Jamie did some follow-up work, some questionnaires, some testing, and, and then at the end, talked to farmers about, you know, barriers and so on. Um, I won't necessarily get into all the details, but there were some things that really jumped out at us. And, and I think we have some lessons to learn. One of which is when we repeated these risk assessments, you know, we it's easy to focus on one disease and say there are things that we need to do. For instance, to control Yoni's disease, what we want to see happen, or one of the things that we recommended was that newborn calf, we grab that calf before it hits the ground, separate it from it, from its dam, get it out of that environment to limit the possibility of that manure meal we talked about earlier and get it into a hutch or an individual pen and allow it to grow without exposure to MAP, right? So limit limit that exposure. Sure. But at the same time in the dairy industry, we've got other influences. For instance, a lot of discussion from a welfare perspective about actually having group calving pens or keeping the calf with the cow longer, right? Or group raising calves. So rather than individual pens to group pens, which are all really great from a welfare perspective, but run a little bit contrary from our disease control perspective, right? So, you know, it, it sort of opened our eyes to say, okay, we've got to think about this and maybe we need to, you know, it's not about a one point in time. It's not about right. launching a program and running with it. We've got to continue to tweak the program. We've got to find solutions that allow us to do disease control and yet adapt to all of these outside pressures. Because in fact, the herds that quote unquote failed were doing a lot of things which were really good from a you know, from from a uh, animal care welfare perspective and so on. So there were more, you know, more group housing of calves, which is a good thing in those social interactions. Um, you know, they were actually getting more colostrum or better colostrum. Um, we had also suggested that, you know, the, the way Yonis gets introduced to herds is actually by buying animals, right? It's that buyer beware mentality and, and, 
you know, one of the things we found in the follow-up work that Jamie did, in fact, that producers had taken that to heart and, and weren't buying as many animals or when they were buying, they were being more careful, often purchasing from a single source rather than from multiple sources. So, you know, what we thought was a failure was, wasn't was necessarily, I think we had made some progress in the industry, but also the environment had changed a little bit. So it meant, you know, we've got to go back and, and tweak some of these things. And that also came out a bit, I think, when Jamie was talking to dairy producers about sort of, you know, what things they were a bit frustrated about. And, you know, it, it's, again, we tend to push programs that are very focused, very narrow, but you know, dairy producers have all sorts of things that they're thinking about on a day-to-day basis. And so they balance all of these things. And, you know, at one point in time, yonis may have been a priority, but the current priority may be focused on on something quite different. So, you know, we've got to find ways to keep them engaged for a longer period of time. We need to make sure that we researchers, veterinarians, others in the industry are sort of being cheerleaders, keeping it you know, keeping it going, getting them to talk about it, getting them to think about it, and then finding those creative solutions that when they do make a management change for something like welfare, for instance, that we go, okay, so this may set us back a little bit from this perspective, but what can we do from another perspective, for instance, so that, you know, the calving pen thing that I talked about, it may be that we do some proactive testing of cows and and we calve the positive cows in one pen and the negative cows in the other pen so that at least those calves that are born to negative mothers aren't as in in you know exposed to uh, the map organism and so on so i think we've got to be creative and and we learned a lot of good things from what what Jamie was able to do Yes, that's very interesting. Like you mentioned, uh, everyone needs to be involved on the control and the solution of this problem, right? I just would like to uh, emphasize here that there is a website about it. So make sure that you take a look on that as well. And well, Dave, uh, we talked about biosecurity programs. Um, we focused a little bit more on Yon's disease. And I would like to bring our last topic, which is management practices and some decision making. So uh, we know that um, this is a very important topic in their farming, and I would like to discuss uh, some management practices that perhaps could be uh, could improve health, welfare, and productivity of their farming. So, uh, do you think that design? I think I already mentioned uh, some ideas about it, but design of their facilities could be involved with all of this and could be part of the solution and control of diseases. Yeah, that's that's a great question. And I think certainly the answer to that is yes. Because they're, you know, I think one of the one of the challenging and fun things about working in the dairy industry is that it's very different than, you know, I mentioned poultry and swine earlier. Um, but I can look, you know, on my drive from home to the university, which is about 30 minutes, I pass eight more now, 15 poultry barns. And they're all virtually the same. The poultry industry has sort of developed a model for housing poultry that is is very efficient for their needs, and it tends to be very consistent. I think anybody who's been on a dairy farm knows that every dairy farm is different. Every time we, you know, producers build a new facility, I think they, you know, the certainly many of them look around, talk to their neighbors, talk to others, talk to experts, and and try to improve on what was done previously. So every facility is different. And some of the changes that we make are are better. Some don't work out as well. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, sometimes we make changes for one reason, and that may be for cow comfort or welfare or whatever, um, or a particular disease, but there are unintended consequences where that design maybe puts us at increased risk of either within or or between her disease spread. So again, a lot of competing issues. But I think for us, you know, as as we think about this moving forward, I think, um, you know, we talked about having a, a good, comfortable place for cows to calve, for instance. 
you know, and I think I don't have to go back too far. And, and in fact, my grandparents farmed and, you know, it was common to have a couple of box stalls that were used for calving, but they were also used for sick cows and so on. And I think we've come a long way to separating those types of facilities. Sick cows go in one part of the barn, calving cows and calves go in another part. I think we've got very comfortable places for cows to, to calve in general. Um, yes, there's probably more group group calving and, and that's okay. But again, when we're doing those kinds of things, then we have to up our game in terms of cleanliness of the environment. Right. So we want to make sure that we keep a lot of fresh bedding in there, move man remove manure whenever we can. Again, with the goal of minimizing that manure meal, because, you know, we talked a lot about Yoni's disease, but there are a lot of um, diseases that are transmitted through that fecal oral route. In other words, are, are passed through the manure, sometimes through milk or colostrum or a dirty udder to that newborn calf. Um, a lot of the infectious diseases, the diarrhea that we see or the respiratory diseases that we see, sometimes those the, the calves develop those because of the contact they've had with mature animals in, in the calving area. So we've got to be a little bit careful about thinking about, okay, how do we manage that environment to decrease the 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 risk of those calves getting sick whether it's yonis or or other causes of diarrhea for instance and i think we can do that i think a lot of the things that we developed and and that we put in the yonis um risk assessment and management program or ramp as as we have called it um in in fact you know while they're targeting yonis control a lot of those things also will help reduce other calf hood diseases, especially other causes of, of diarrhea, whether that's E. coli, crypto, or, or what have you. So things like making sure the calf gets good quality colostrum uh, when it's born, enough of that good quality colostrum, making sure that we feed those young calves um, as much as, as, as they need and can consume so that they're strong, so that they develop a strong immune system, you know, all sorts of things like that. So I think, I think we've got the ability, I think we've got the tools, I think we have the knowledge that we just need to make sure that we up our game and, and keep our game sort of at that high level. Because I think, yes, facilities are involving our knowledge of facilities, technologies, and all those other things. But I think I think they'll all allow us to do what we need to do um, for for the cow and, and, and the calf. Um, so, well, we're getting close to the end here. But um, I was wondering, what would be other management practices that uh, perhaps we should be thinking more about uh, to improve welfare and also production in the next years? So um, we didn't talk about it, but cow, well, we mentioned a little bit about it, but cow movement is involved on in that, right? Risk assessments or an effective response approach. Like, what other management practices we should be thinking and looking forward to the next years? Um, uh, and I mean to control and perhaps eradication of, for example, young disease. Yeah, so so I think all those things, we've got tools. I think the other things that, to me, are, are a bit exciting is is we've got a lot of technologies coming to dairy farms. Right, we've got a lot of lot of um, new sensors, a lot of tools. We've got a lot of our farms moving to robotic milking, um, and and so as we move forward, I think we'll have some better and better technologies and decision support systems around them to allow us to detect disease or other abnormalities, things that contribute to poor welfare more quickly and more consistent consistently so you know we now have in some of our systems for instance cameras that that can assess body condition on animals again early days they're not perfect we've got a lot of people working on sort of camera based movement based systems to detect lame cows that might have digital dermatitis or other things that are both a health and a welfare concern um, we've got a lot of technologies that, you know, I talked about bulk tank testing, 
where we were taking that milk sample to a lab to test it for certain diseases. Well, we've got more and more technologies that are looking to test that milk sample right on the farm at the time of milking to shorten that loop and, and give the farmer and, and the herd veterinarian a lot more current, quicker information about uh, the health status of individual cows. And, and so again, utilizing those technologies, learning, implementing the best ones, you know, we'll discard some along the way for sure. And then building good support systems and decision systems around them where we're not getting too many false positive or false negative alarms. There's a lot of work to be done there, but but I get excited by things like artificial intelligence and machine learning. A lot of organizations working in that area. Lactinet has a whole team that's trying to utilize some of those those new skills and so on. In fact, Jamie Amata, who I mentioned earlier, has uh, dabbled a little bit in in machine learning to try to um, better select cows for Yoni's testing, for instance. Um, you know, again, very early days, but I think there are all sorts of things like that that will allow us to even fine tune our programs a little bit quicker and give us that feedback more quickly about, you know, if if we make a change and things improve in one area, but perhaps start to deteriorate in another, we'll flag those for us so we can say, okay, now what do we need to do to steer that ship in the right direction? So anyway, I think we've got a lot of things there that are coming down the pipe that I'm really excited about and and to see what happens in the next 20, 10 years or so, I think will be really, really interesting. That's great, Dave. Yes, I'm very excited as well to see the, the, the impact of new technologies um, on health, welfare, and dairy farming, right? Yeah, so, and so the other thing that I mentioned meant to mention there was was also, you know, pretty excited. And I've had the opportunity to work with with uh, Christine Bays in in um, in our in our genetics group at the University of Guelph. And and Christine has a number of students who are working on, again, uh, resilience in in dairy cattle. So not only those technologies, but breeding technologies. Right? Can we identify animals that are more resistant to disease? I talked about calves. She's got a graduate student, Colin Lynch, who's who's really um, interested in calf management and looking at, you know, can we develop some, incorporate some genetic evaluation, uh, sort of calf resilience and, and resistance, if you will, to diarrhea and respiratory disease as part of our genetic selection program moving forward. So again, another technology that I think is uh, is pretty exciting. Yeah, it's great that you mentioned that because actually Dr. Christine Bays is the next guest for the podcast. So <laughs> great. We will hear a little bit about it. So, well, this is the end of this episode. And I would you like to, to thank Dr. Kelton uh, for participating and sharing all this great information uh, on dairy cattle diseases, welfare and management. Thank you very much, Dave. It's been my pleasure. Thanks very much for uh, for having me. Great. Yes. Thanks, everyone, for listening to us. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Um, and our, net, our next guest will be Dr. Christine Bays. I see you there. <laughs>